Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Deborah Watson, Advisory Services Team Manager from Innovate UK Edge. This series, Innovate 2021, has looked at enabling ambitious, innovative SMEs to overcome challenges and build for growth. We've covered a huge range of topics from agile working, funding and finance, to business leadership and internationalization. Each event has promoted the broader bespoke support available from Innovate UK Edge and how we can add value to your future growth plans in this challenging environment. But before we get started today, a little housekeeping. There will be a question and answer session. Um, you'll be, please feel free to put those in the chat or in the Q&A function of the webinar. Um, please raise your hand if you need any assistance. Um, the chat is unmoderated and enables you to communicate with other attendees. For the purposes of on-demand, this webinar is being recorded and your personal video and microphones will not be used unless you're invited to speak by the hosts. For our final webinar in the series, we feature two heavyweight brands and the expert knowledge of Heather, Heather and Ralph, who will share their expertise on turning your vision into reality. But first, as a participant of Innovate 2021, and subject to Innovate UK's eligibility criteria, there is an opportunity for you act to access our comprehensive range of support. I'll give you the full details of how we may be able to support you after we've heard from our speakers. So let's please welcome Innovation and Growth Specialists, Heather Wright, who was formerly Executive Director Partner Content at Ardman Animations, and Ralph Wood, who was Senior Product Development Manager at Dyson. Heather and Ralph will talk about creating an innovation culture to a design and development framework. Good morning, Heather. Good morning, Ralph. And over to you both. Good morning. Can you see me okay? Is everything good? No. Morning. Can you see me now? Hi. Good morning, everybody. So, yeah, thank you very much, Deborah. So, um, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for turning out early this morning to hear us speak. Um, I worked as an executive producer at Ardman for over 20 years and I left at the middle of last year to develop some of my own creative ideas. I'm still doing that, but part of my portfolio these days is working with Business West as an innovation advisor, to bring my kind of creative approach to business strategy to companies of all shapes and sizes. And this short talk from me is about how innovation in a creative company can work. And although it does focus on the idea of creating animation for television, there are certainly themes that can be applied across many sectors. And of course, all of these ideas and views are my own. All right, I think screen not pressing. There you go. So the first thing to think about is how do you create a culture of innovation? So new ideas and new ways of doing things are the freshly oxygenated blood of any business, as we all know. So it's really important to encourage ideas from anyone, anywhere in the company. And all ideas that you hear about should be respected and given the courtesy of being fed back on. It's nothing worse than this ideas or suggestion box that goes into a black hole. Um, one really good thing to do is have regular whole company updates about the business and the development strategy, keeping everyone involved and aware of what's going on. Not all the details certainly, but quarterly is, is certainly good. With that comes the need for everyone to have a really good understanding of the importance of the confidentiality of IP, because once ideas start to get out into the ether, it's impossible to prove where the idea started or who owns it. Um, and also you need to show commitment to the idea of innovation by actually having money and time allocated in your annual company budget. So when we're thinking about a new idea for television, the question we're really asking is, does it feel like the kind of show this company would make? Does it fit our brand? Um, is it funny? Is it charming? Is it British? Kind of three essential questions we would think about. Um, then we like the idea of a champion. Does it have a champion and who is it? So a champion is somebody that really believes in the idea from its core and they're essential for maintaining the vision and the belief in the core original idea as the project progresses. Very often projects that don't have champions. There's often an idea that people coalesce around because everybody loves the character design or Everybody loves the two line on a post-it note idea, but actually because no one actually owns it, there's no debt. Uh, then can the idea scale to fit what the market will pay for this kind of idea? And there's a level, level of reality attached to any idea, no matter how, how amazing it might be. 
thirdly, do we have any potential partners in mind? Is there anyone immediately obvious who it would be worth talking to? Is someone has someone spoke to us about this kind of idea, about this kind of show, or looking for an opportunity that this might fit? And do we know anything else out there or in here in a similar creative territory? Very often ideas, as I said, do get out into the ether, but also you'll find that for some reason, suddenly three mouse ideas will pop up and you've got no idea why mice are the thing this week that they tend to be. Which is obviously fine at this stage, but when you're releasing a feature from or releasing a new show on television, you don't want to be competing for the same broadcast with the same content. And the last thing is, of course, do we have the resources to, to develop this idea now? What else is going on? And can we actually do this idea justice? So much of the work in a creative company is produced to order, but the content of the work isn't specified. Often a, a broadcaster or a platform or a brand will actively put out a call for a specific type of show or a piece of animation. So that fit to business plan is really critical. Do we have the capacity and resources to respond? And what's the opportunity cost? If we didn't do this show, what else would we be doing? And is, if someone is looking to put an idea, maybe a 12 times five minute idea series, on there in six months, then we probably can't help. Let's be realistic now. But if they want it for next year, then yeah, let's have a chat. In terms of the internal process, the creators of the idea really need understanding and clarity on what the process will be. Who is going to be making the decisions? What are the deliverables going to be? What are the milestones? What is the IP situation? And when do you need something by? And lastly, what kind of budget are we, are we talking about? You know, 100,000, 500,000, a million, we'll all buy very different creative outputs. And to a certain extent, creative ideas can be written to a budget parameter. So an open call for ideas is the best way, we believe the brief is shared with everybody. Um, so creators have a, who have a capacity to think of an idea will always turn up to a call. But even if you're not a creator, coming to the call for ideas presentation is a great way of knowing what's going on in the company. It's really inclusive from the off. And if someone comes up with a big idea, it could be going on in your workflow for years. And it's really good to be able to say you were there at the beginning, even if you work in a different team or a different part of the company. And of course it has, I have known ideas to not come from the creative part of the company. So you just don't know where a good idea is going to come from. So that brief in the call for ideas will include things like who the broadcaster and platform is, which will give a flavor to the show, what the number and the length of the episodes they're looking for is, who are the target audience, is it families, is it kids, is it co-viewing, what's the genre, is it comedy, drama, is it education, is a technique been specified, is it 2D like The Simpsons, is it CGI like a full Pixar thing, or is it stop frame like Shaun the Sheep, or is it any combination of the above and could even include some live action. And then what's the submission format, how do you want to see my ideas, how much work should I put into this idea at this stage, and when do you want it by? So the first round for submissions will usually generate around 30 to 40 ideas, which we call the long list. And that idea at that point is one to two pages long. And one to two pages is much harder to, to achieve than six to eight or even 10 pages, because it's about getting the kernel of the idea really crystallized and deciding whether or what's the strongest part of the idea that you really want to focus on at that part, at that point. There's a panel will assess the ideas against the brief. Obviously, we're always looking for sheer brilliance. We're obviously looking for something that, okay, this doesn't meet the brief, but it is an amazing idea. We should park that and have a separate conversation about it. From that long list, maybe six to eight ideas will be optioned from the creator for one year for a fee. So creators um, within the uh, Arden family and with the creator family, there are often people that we know that don't actually work on staff, but are freelance. So we will invite them, we kind of treat them as part of our community, we will invite them along to the call for ideas anyway. So optioning the idea for a year for a fee kind of gives the company enough time to work out whether the idea's got legs, whether it's going to fly without any huge commitment on either side. The clarity on the ownership of the IP is critical at every stage, but especially this one, because it may be the creators, Wallace and Gromit, it may be their big one, and they don't want to feel like they're being ripped off and you don't want them to, them to, you don't want to rip them off or you don't even want to, them to feel like they're being ripped off and it's right that they should have a share of success. There is an idea that if you do something within the course of your work, the IP is automatically owned by the company. But as a, as a company, I think it makes really good business practice to still 
uh, allow people, even if they're on staff, even if technically the company does own the idea, that they should be able to share in that success. And what, are, what they might also be really concerned about is what their role on the project is going to be. Are they going to be a director, are they going to be a producer, or are they just going to be a stakeholder? If they're currently a writer or a designer, they may be hoping for a kind of a leg up to being the director, or if they're a production manager, they may be looking for a producing opportunity. Or if they work in finance, they may just be happy to have a stake in the project and to be involved. It can be a really tricky one to manage as clients, i.e. the people that are paying for it. Often want what they call is what they call is kind of proven talent. They want someone that's got track experience on their show. So from a producer's point of view, it's really a mistake at this point to promise the earth to a creator at this stage. But you need to give them some comfort that they will be attached and they will have some influence. Albeit it, that it's definitely your intention that they do get that step up. Maybe it's going to be co-director or co-producer. The projects at this stage have a small amount of cash allocated to them to, to develop what we call a mini Bible. That's sufficient money to give a director, a producer, a writer and a designer time to some time, some paid time to spend on the idea. It's enough to come up with the premise, the characters, initial episode outlines, maybe a first pass on designs and uh, initial outlines of stories. So you've all heard of um, development hell. Well, fail early, fail fast and move on is common in many industries and in it's no different in filmmaking and it's the antidote to development hell. The thing about creators and production companies is they're always really passionate about their ideas. And during development, the ideas aren't necessarily fixed. So people who buy creative know that and often they aren't sure whether they would feel differently about it if the character were a policeman instead of a farmer or if there were more dinosaurs or if it was set in space. So this sets up a situation where people tweak and noodle and noodle and tweak for a really long time, believing that a green light could be just around the corner. And the bottom line really is that every single idea is, is a prototype. So and every show will require an adaptation of the process and the technology. And the mini Bible allows you to test the idea with the market early with your kind of really trusted relationships. It's not, a formal, it's not a formal presentation. It's not saying, would you like to make this? It's more of a whispering over coffee or a quiet conversation on the side of another meeting. And it allows you to establish whether or not there's even an appetite for the concept, whether or not there's, there could be an audience and some idea of the idea of the cost per minute that a buyer would be looking to pay for an idea like this. After the mini Bible, two to three of the projects and from after talking to people in the market, would have naturally risen to the top through kind of normal attrition, through further questioning of the ideas. Um, and that's either kind of internal or external momentum, but there's always one idea that will just refuse to, to lie down instantly. And that's usually because it's just really loved internally. But the next step is to create a full pitch Bible, which can be pitched to potential partners. And that will include things like a killer visual. And the killer visual is a, a beautiful piece of artwork that puts the characters in their environment and tells the whole story of the show. You may have a script for a whole episode. You probably will have block character designs and a line off of the characters. You'll definitely have a, a starting point for a production budget, budget and schedule. And for that, obviously you need to decide on the technique, the process, and possibly identify production partners. You'll be looking at attaching cast, checking out the availabilities of well-known cast, especially, and testing the water with them because of a really well-known voice cast can make all the difference to a broadcaster deciding they want to go ahead with the project or not. And that can be a tricky thing to manage with creators who may know an actor or an actress that they really love, but no one's ever heard of. You can only have a certain number of unknowns on a project and you can't have an unknown director, unknown cast, unknown producer. There have to be some things they can bank on. And that could be the reputation of the company, but it's still, when you're getting out onto the bums on seats to the audiences, they will recognize the name of a famous actor. Very often, this, the creator contract at this point is also going to be finalised and tying down the details of what the share of future profits will be, when they will be paid, if they're, what the um, detail on exploiting, further exploitation of the rights through merchandise or spin-off series, that will be finalised at this stage as well. And very often there'll be a short animation test which could be 30 seconds to two minutes long. So, Partners are absolutely critical. So whilst in theory it is possible to make a show without partners, it's rarely advisable. And partners are usually sought after and fought over. 
because obviously having a partner reduces the risk, it validates the creative, and they may even plus your creative with you. And they will always have complementary resources and expertise. The type of partners you're looking for are, in the, in the first instance, it's probably going to be co-production partners. These are going to production, be other production companies, probably in a tax-friendly jurisdiction like Ireland or Canada, where we've got co-production treaties. Um, and that this way, the production is split across the two companies, sharing the risk, sharing the responsibility, but also obviously sharing the reward. Co-production partners might not be relevant, especially if the show's already set up and repeating. So, for example, um, you know, on a, show, on a show like Sean the Sheep, there would be no reason to co-produce a show like that. The commissioning partners are the ones that are there with you for the whole journey. They're the ones that are going to fund the bulk of the next stage of development and the show itself. And they will, they will likely want to have creative input, which could also create some need for management internally with the original creators and the champions. But um, in return, they will, so they will share you, they will have input to the development stage and they will pay for the whole production. And in return, they will take all, or if you're lucky, some of the profits, according to the rights they've agreed to for the, for the, for the funding they've, they've bought. This could be a global deal. So someone like Netflix coming on the scene who will buy a show for global release. Could be, a, could be a godsend, but could mean you just basically hand the show over. And you know, negotiating your position is always gonna to be tougher in that situation. And also have, but having one client like Netflix is gonna be much easier to manage. The other way of going is having a partnership of other broadcasters. So you may have, for example, BBC in the UK, WDR in Germany or ABC in Australia. Very few television companies can afford to fund a whole show themselves. Um, and, the, and they'll be responsible for the, also responsible for the marketing and distribution in their territories. And acquisition partners are the partners that license the show after completion. So you want to retain as many rights as you can when you're first having the show, putting the show into green light to allow yourself some, some opportunity to make additional upside by selling further rights for specific numbers of screenings, for a particular term and for a particular territory. So now you've got your partners on board, you now move into full development. The development hell really goes on and on and on. So at this point, your partner will enable you to put a significant amount of cash in order to develop the idea sufficiently well to decide whether or not it will go into production. This will, pull a, this will entail a full review of the scripts, a full episode script we have really well written. So you might well have a named writer or a really experienced writer on board at this stage and this all starts to become serious cash. You will definitely have episode outlines for a further 12 or 24 episodes, maybe even 52. You'll definitely be looking at developing the world further, with more, more characters and developing the, um, the, the development of the world. And that will be taking on board feedback from your new partner now. You'll be looking to fill up the casting, maybe produce an animatic, which is a 2D black and white storyboard frames edited together to make a, a rough version of what the edit will look like. You'll definitely have a detailed budget and production schedule and the presentation to the final decision makers. Will All the contracts will be lined up, everything will be ready to go and be waiting for the final decision maker at the broadcaster. At the broadcaster. So the final hurdle for development is this green light or turnaround. So, the, so you may even not be at the green light presentation to the internal um, people at the broadcast or the, or the funding place you're getting your funding from. It could be done by your, your partner, your producer partner within that organisation. So, so, the, they, so the, it's, they're going to be their decision without your input, without that, oh, I like you, I think you're quite a nice person, I can see you might have legs, no charisma attached. It's really about the details of do, is this idea going to have got legs? Is it going to make money? Are, is our audience going to love it? And for this, at this point, you'll be pulling together your final pitch package, any final creative tweaks, get your key contracts in place, director, producer, writer, designer, and cast, particularly if they're well known. Your production logistics are going to be tied down, any technical R&D is completed. And that's why, you know, one of the reasons why television is so risky, especially in the first round, is because it's always a prototype, as I talked about earlier. Um, but everything is basically tied down, ready to go and held off pending that decision for a green light. And if, it, if you get the green light back, fantastic. And then the corks, the corks will get popped. But if it's turnaround, then what you do is everybody has a beer, you go home, you have the weekend off to decide what to do next. 
And turnaround is the name of the process whereby the buyer decides not to proceed into production. Despite everything they've spent, they've looked at the six or eight or 10 shows they're about to commission and decided that actually this is the one they don't want to go with. So then that means that the cost that you and they have occurred effectively sit attached to the project. And they either then become part of that budget that needs to be recouped when the show goes into production with someone else, effectively making it more expensive to put into production, or it may come out of future receipts if that's the way you're able to negotiate the deal. So finally, you get into production. Um, and this with a fair wind, this will be around one to two years since the idea was first conceived. Shorter maybe if it was in response to a brief and longer if it wasn't. And production itself could take anywhere from six to 18 months. So the whole cycle from innovation to bums on seats could be around 18 months to three and a half years and easily longer, especially if it's a really big show or a really big feature film. Uh, Pre-production, production and post-production is a really quick phrase that it gathers all the work that's done over those 18 months into a short phrase and hopefully kind of happens smoothly, but that's a subject of a whole other conversation. And the next critical part for finance in your next show is the season one delivery, the marketing and PR and the critics reviews. The marketing and PR can completely break a show. So getting the trailers right creatively, getting it in the right slots on air, getting everyone to see it, together with great critics reviews, because people do really, if you're gonna watch a new show, you do look at the reviews. Everyone looks on Rotten Tomatoes, everyone looks on IMDb. Am I gonna spend my time watching this show, whether it's on television, whether it's at the cinema, whether it's on my computer. Uh, and that will heavily, heavily influence the planning for season two. And very often the season two or kind of holiday specials, things like Christmas, Halloween, are already in the pipeline at this stage. And then creating that and the marketing PR and that is a whole other story. So that's a, a kind of a very brief visit on what the development process for television looks like. And now it's time to get your own creative juices flowing. So I've put together three, three creative ideas. Um, which I'm going to ask you to vote on. And being a producer, I make no apology for the quality of the ideas, but hopefully they'll be good enough for this to work. I'm going to show them to you now, and I'd like you to decide which ones you'd like to take forward into development, and then I will respond afterwards and let you know what my decision would be and why. So here's the three ideas. So the first one's called Zebediah Zoo. So I want you to imagine a zoo where the animals are in charge. I want you to join Zookeeper, zookeeper Cam and his sidekick spooks, as every night they do their best to keep the zoo in tippity-top condition before it opens for visitors in the morning. The audience is five to seven-year-old children. It's a family audience. The genre is comedy. The technique is going to be stop frame, and it's going to be 26 10-minute episodes, which is a very common format that's used for this um, age group. So that's the first one. Kind of think about Zebediah Zoo. Next one is Bebo and Bush. So Bebo is a ladybird who lives to explore nature and the world around her. Her friend Bush is a frog who is scared of almost everything and therefore always hiding behind a bush. He's scared of a leaf blowing in the wind and ants crossing the path in front of him. And the trouble is, when this happens, he jumps and croaks loudly, upsetting whatever Bebo is trying to investigate or trying to talk about. The audience for this is preschool. It's gonna be fun, it's gonna be educational. The technique is 2D, so flat 2D, and it's going to be 52 five minute episodes. So in other words, the, the significance of 52 is it could be programmed over a year, or it could take up a significant ch chunk of time. Broadcast will always need to fill up time. Third one is Crime City Capers. You see in my uh, reduced capacity as a producer, I could only think of alliterative titles, so I apologize for that. This idea is about The Simpsons meets CSI Miami meets Police Academy, which is a very common way of talking about the tone and the feel of shows. You've heard people talking about it before. And the idea here is that the policemen and women of Crime City Police Department always get their man or woman. But how can this be when they are actually the most incompetent force in the state? And discover who or what behind their incredible achievements. The audience for this is adult and family. The genre is comedy drama. The technique is again is 2D and it's 26 times 20 minutes or 22 minutes, which is effectively an American half hour with ads. So there's the three ideas. 
have a little think about those now and I will um, give you a moment to vote. Please do vote as I'm going to feel very stupid and um, I'll come back and tell you which one I think I would have gone with. Just going to give it 30 seconds or so. If you don't know, gut feel is often a really good way to decide. Okay, do we have a look at the votes now? Okay, oh, that's quite interesting. So uh, I'll share the results with you. Zebedai is quite evenly split. Zebedai's zoo got 36%. Bebo and Bush got 27%. And Crime City Capers got 36%. That's really interesting. So I'm telling, going to tell you which one I would go with now. So I would actually go with B, B Bone Bush, which is the one that the least people voted for. And these are the reasons for that. So Zebediah Zoo is about a man with a cat who's trying to make sense of the zoo. Is that a bit like a man with a dog trying to make sense of a farm or another well-known man and dog? There's quite a lot of work in this territory. Plus it's stop frame. We've all done a lot of stop frame in exactly this territory. We've already done animals that misbehave once their humans turn their backs and it's dialogue so it's going to be much more expensive to reversion. So yeah, got potential, nice idea but not my top choice for this one. Crime City Papers. So this is an overworked genre, it could just as easily be live action. We don't know what the reasons why, uh, what the secret powers or whatever are going to be, whether or not they would require animation, but it could just as easily be live action. Why make something with animation if it worked just as well? in live action. Plus it's American and we're not, it's very clearly set in America. Best to write about something you know, rather than tell the Americans about their own cities. And despite best efforts, adult animation successes are still few and far between. Everybody is looking for the next, sim next Simpsons. There's gonna be much less slots on air for that kind of show. Uh, Bebo and Bush, the, pre the preschool market is absolutely evergreen. There's always a new generation of preschoolers coming along. It's nice, clean 2D graphics, and therefore be quite cost effective to produce. And I think that budget could work for the money available in this market. Plus at the moment, we don't have another strong preschool offering in our catalog. So that's why I would choose Bebo and Bush. Admittedly, a lot of that comes with the knowledge of what is already on the slate. And you, I couldn't possibly explain that, but um, a lot of it just comes from experience and gut feel, but I really hope you've had some fun uh, thinking about it. And that's me, thank you very much. Gonna hand over to Ralph now. Bear with me. Right, hopefully you can all see my screen. Thanks, Deborah. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, Heather. That was uh, amazing insight into the world of Ardman. Um, so I'm gonna change the scene slightly and talk about um, consumer product development. Um, and I'm gonna step you through four key questions I usually use to test the health of any new product development project. Bear in mind, these are based around consumer domestic products, um, but could be easily adapted for other applications. Before I do that, just a quick intro to me. Um, yes, 20 years working at Dyson within its uh, RDD function. Um, I played multiple roles there from principal engineer to design manager, um, global optimization manager, um, spanning research, NPI, RDD, and um, new product um, introduction in, in Southeast Asia. So, so end to end through the process, um, developing products from washing machines to hand dryers, vacuum cleaners, hair dryers, you name it. Um, so uh, I'll, let's just spin forward to these questions. So the first one is, is all about checking that you've got the right idea and how confident you are that it adds value. The second one is, can you afford it? Now this is really probing into um, the business model that it's based around and the, the, the associated finance model with that. Um, can you deliver it? So do you have the right capabilities to actually deliver on that promise and deliver that idea to market within uh, the timescales and costs that make it feasible? 
Um, and do you have the right culture? So do you have the right people with the right approach and the right beliefs to enable that success? So let's just start with the right idea. So firstly, what is a, a valuable product? Well, I, I have a, a rule of thumb that I usually use to test any product and, and that's this. It's got to be useful, usable and desirable. So it flows quite nice, it's quite easy to remember. But what that really means is, in terms of useful, it's got to provide useful performance features and functions that save time, money, or provide some social or, or emotional benefit. Um, and these are the things that really drive your claims and, and go into your advertising. Usability, so the interface with that product must provide an intuitive interaction point to actually enable the user to, to access that useful functionality and performance. And then finally, desirable. Well, be it through aesthetics, uh, feel, touch, kudos of the brand, there needs to be an attraction to the product at an emotional level. But all of this has to be delivered within whatever applied constraints there are. So it, it's, you could argue it's quite easy, I would say um, very easy, but it's possible to, to meet those criteria, but not stick within the, within the constraints of cost, time, regulatory or environmental, or what your competitors are doing. So that's the thing that makes product development really hard. So use those criteria on any, any product, just choose one, look around, they, they really do work. The next point is all about doing your homework. So you've got your idea, you think it's useful, usable, desirable, but the next thing you really need to do is validate the value in your idea. Now, typically, so incremental products are, again, <laughs> I hesitate to say the word easy, but they are easier to develop in that you can use relatively traditional market research um, and user research met methods coupled with expert opinion to provide sufficient confidence that you're adding value. However, if you're in the business of innovating, you're more likely to develop um, an unprecedented unpre product or an existing one that tackles an unspoken need. Um, in Dyson, we called these clear, clear bin ideas. Um, sounds a bit silly, but um, the reason being is, so the example here, James Dyson was advised, never, never, never have a clear bin or allow the user to see the dirt. Now he, he just didn't take that. And th this was the first time it had ever been done. So, um, but this is what experts and people were advising him to do. But so the next real takeaway here is if you've got an instinct, test it, absolutely test it to death before you go any further, just to really build that belief in your idea. Because he really thought that people seeing the dirt would would provide enormous feedback and satisfaction using the product. And he was right. So um, yeah, never rely on the existing market data or, or expert opinion alone as the sole basis of confidence in your idea. Test it to death with friendly users and work with those people from the very earliest point then be bold with, with your uh, idea as you should have that confidence. And don't spend the earth on, on making that happen. James Dyson famously produced thousands of prototypes. Well, to be honest, that I, I absolutely uh, stick to that as a, as, a, as a takeaway. They don't have to be expensive. And as, as Heather said you know, previously, an interesting overlap is fail fast, fail often. So really iterate the design as quickly as you possibly can. So once you've done all of that, um, now what you need to do is set the vision. So we talk a lot about minimum viable products. Um, defining the lowest spec boundary that delivers value for money is obviously critical. But what about the top end? So what's, what's really driving your ambition there? So applying the same rules of feasibility Stating what would truly exceed and delight your customers beyond their imagination is just as important. Dyson didn't really like the phrase MVP um, and it was seen as tar setting targets too low, leaving nothing to drive your, your upper limits of ambition. You might have, for example, you might have capability in your technology, 
that gives you more performance for relatively little cost or effort. But without that drive to uh, leverage that, then you may never achieve it or, or capitalize. So, um, you know, you may have a good product, but it might not be great unless you have that aspirational vision. The other benefit is that it really sets a vision for your team, your investors and your partners. And it's, it's actually quite Japanese in culture that a lot of Japanese engineers really um, set the, the upper limit for as an aspiration goal and everybody believes in that target. Sorry, th this, this um, example here is, <laughs> I'd be shot if I showed you a Dyson one. So this is a, uh, something, something else I found, but it, it really does just show what the vision is for the product. And, it, and it's effectively what you might see what you want to see on the TV advert effectively and what it's going to look like at the very end. So strive to meet your vision rather than struggle to meet your MVP. Um, and this also really ties in with the, the culture of your business as well, which I'll talk, in, talk to a bit later. The next question about affordability, so can you afford it? Product development is expensive. You can't get away from that. Um, Understanding the business case is absolutely critical to ensure your idea is viable. And there are two main activities here that, that um, you really need to do almost as soon as you think you've got a good idea. So modeling your, your business model, getting that up to, up to speed, understanding the landscape um, and the, your position within it, knowing the whole ecosystem so that you can anticipate the demands and needs of the people you interact with directly and the flow of money through that system. This enables you to build the right elements into your finance model um, and build this as soon as you possibly can and just iterate it constantly. Um, face your evils too. I, I meet lots of people that shy away from the both of these elements and they're absolutely critical. If you don't, you'll fall over. Um, if you don't have time, then assign it to somebody that does. Um, and forget it at your peril. Otherwise, you may risk losing your investors. Um, and so, however, not having a clearly defined and um, mapped business model isn't purely the domain of those that don't know, if you're new to all of this. Um, even big, big companies make mistakes. Um, it's just that they're better at absorbing those mistakes than, than you as a startup, potentially. So I'm going to show you a few well-known Dyson products um, and I'm going to ask you to vote which one failed to meet its growth target within the first three years so and then we'll, we'll uh, ask you to uh, vote on on each of those so here we go so the first one is the Dyson Dyson fan the air multiplier the hairdryer supersonic the hand dryer air blade and the uh, LED ceiling light CE beam so um, if Marcus, it's possible to start the poll. So vote, yeah, which one do you think failed to meet um, its growth target? So which one was the, did we get the, the business model wrong? So, excellent, very interesting. Um, well, so thanks very much. Fan, 8%, hair dryer, 8%, hand dryer, 8%, but the light, 75%. I bet that's because that's the least well-known product. Um, but yes, mostly right there. But actually, if I can go back to the screen, if I can click on that. It was both of these, actually, because they were both actually commercial products. I know everyone talks about the, the hand dryer as well, just coming out of the, the toilets and hey, did you see that, that hand dryer? Um, but actually Dyson um, didn't spend enough time understanding the commercial landscape that they were selling into being a consumer domestic uh, product business and the purchasing cycle of, of those products actually they're completely misunderstood so it took quite a long time for those to ramp up and actually um, return on their investment finally they did thankfully but again it's it's um, 
it was it was a financial shock that a small business might not be able to absorb so so do beware the next question is about capabilities so look at your business as a machine consisting of the, these four key capabilities so first of all your people um, it's not just your people it's how they're organized so identifying the right skills and experience you need to help you is critical um, organizing them the right way is also then crucial to get the most out of them you might have a team of geniuses but if you don't do them justice and organize them in the right way then you, i've seen businesses large and small that that having that they're incredibly inefficient because they haven't structured their their capabilities in the right way so for this one um first define what your value chain is really understand that so these these are the the key steps that bring value to market so for example at dyson it was research design develop make sell and support and those are the key functions that you would um, organize your people around um, and ensure you've got leadership to, to um, own and build those teams but then consider the structure when applied to your product development project so for example small businesses um, would benefit mostly from a hierarchical project structure um, it's most efficient from an ownership and decision-making perspective but as you scale most matrix organizations are a more efficient way of utilizing your resources moving to processes so um, if you're new to product development then it's worth getting some experienced help to define the right development process for your, for your product it's complex so but don't reinvent reinvent the wheel um, when you don't need to once you have a framework um, that covers all the elements uh, of what you need to do as a whole business so looking holistically not just purely on the product um, broken into manageable stages to reduce risk as you go um, then start building a, a detailed plan and once you have that plan really focusing on identifying the critical dependencies throughout there and looking as far ahead as possible as well for any long lead time uh, activities you need to focus on the next is tools and systems so um it, it's a bit dry this one but you know just don't try and don't focus on things that, that you can't really add value to and other people can easily so it for example outsource where you can um, cloud software is improving all the time um, and some great value products um, are around and coming up all the time that really improve productivity and collaboration do watch out for the costs though so back to your cost model um, tools like uh, CAD and um, analysis software are hugely expensive and those may be critical for, for your development so make sure you take those into account at the earliest point um, but also don't slave over the wrong tool so um, I love Excel loads of people love Excel but don't try and run a project plan using Excel so it'll take you forever to update so just get a decent project planning tool um, and then finally this governance this is often overlooked um, by businesses large and small but in combination with a simple development model um, having a lightweight governance process is essential to stopping to review as a team your progress your costs your risks to really make key decisions at regular intervals um, and to help avoid scope creep um, this enables uh, essential course corrections before you go off track too far. Um, and then the other point is it really enables to hold you to hold yourselves to account, um, but get other people involved. So we behave differently when somebody else is holding us account to deliver, even if it's your own business. So try to use people not directly involved in uh, project delivery um, in your project reviews, for example, bring in some of your non-exec team, some of your investors potentially, um, if they're interested and you want to share your, the inner workings of what's going on. Um, subject matter experts that are helping you out or external advisors can make a great review panel. So use those people. So the final point is, is about the right culture in your business. Um, and it's a softer topic, but it's by no means less important. Innovation won't thrive in your business unless you take this seriously um, and you won't attract or retain the best talent either. 
um, endorsing some key values and mantras to help empower your whole business to work autonomously without leadership involvement in every single decision really unlocks some, some efficiency. So um, forgive me, some of these are a bit cliched, but I've seen them working and, and you know, it, it really is um, it's worth taking on board. So yeah, making mistakes builds confidence. So you've heard the phrase fail fast, fail often. I can't reiterate that enough. Rapid design iteration is absolutely essential to understanding and discovering the unknown unknowns um, and really building your confidence. The faster you do this, the faster you learn and reduce your risks in your project. But um, if you're a small business, be smart. So there's a shameful Isaac Newton quote um, on the stand on the shoulders of giants. Well, there's so much help and um, expertise available to help you make the right mistakes. Try and avoid making the wrong ones. This was kind of promoted at, at Dyson to retread old ground, but to be honest, the business outside, they had the luxury to do that. Um, but as a, as a small business, it's really worth trying to capitalize on the knowledge around you um, and make calculated risks rather, rather than um, just delving into the unknown. Bringing, bringing people on the journey. So this, this one is really critical. So um, I call this um, tada no, ta -da moments, if you like. Um, so you've probably all seen examples of this happening, maybe even done it yourselves is when people squirrel away, working, 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 don't see anything, and then all of a sudden, ta-da, right, Crystal Waltz there, brilliant, sorry, cheesy gif, but it really makes the point. Keep everybody informed as to what you're doing, really share what you're doing. It, it's, if you keep it to yourself, it doesn't really promote good, uh, a good team um, spirit. You might have made the right decision. You, what you might have done is amazing, but then that's that's a much smaller chance. Um, and unless you've brought people along the journey, then then it could be time wasted. Um, so default to this behaviour, and you'll prevent bottlenecks of knowledge within your staff, and more understanding investors and closer collaboration. At minimum, try to drive a practice of capturing rationale for decisions made. Uh, this saves a huge amount of time when you're assessing the impact of change um, and saves hours of reworking when you inevitably have to transfer what you're doing to other people further down the chain. Save your tada moment for your product launch. <laughs> um, product is king. So this was the most dominant value that drove Dyson's culture, design, brand, PR, you name it. The logical pro progression of this is to ensure that you have somebody owning that. And in Dyson, that was the design manager. They were king, if you like. This really ensured that all projects had clear ownership um, and decision-making responsibility was very clear. Avoiding design by committee, which really is the antithesis of creativity and innovation. The 80-20 rule, um, I was actually quite, I've become quite surprised, this was a byword at Dyson, but quite surprised how, how sort of little referred to this, this, this has been in my journey outside. Um, perfectionism is in the right measure on a holistic level, quite a, a strength. So constantly driving for better, some good examples as well as Dyson were look at Mercedes Formula One, for example, that they're, they're quite, have quite similar cultures to, strive for excellence, but commercial success as well as on track relies on not just an excellent design, but also getting the product out the door within a timely manner. So um, and remembering that engineers will take as long as they're given. Um, so use it to check that you're not going beyond where you need to in order to deliver most of your value. So that 20% of input gives you 80% of the results. It's a really good way of, of helping you exit um, and, uh, you know, if you're procrastinating, basically. Um, and then finally, perseverance. So this is the driving uh, force really behind part of the, the, the first point, making lots of mistakes. Um, it's uh, innovation involves a lot of failures. Um, 
So take a leaf out of Mr. Edison's book um, and perseverance and resilience will really reward you. Um, it will sustain innovation and make sure that you, you do really persevere and bring that the best idea to life. Um, so, and also a word of warning, um, these are all positive mantras and that will help drive your culture, but um, make sure that as leaders, you don't let your negative um, characteristics come to light because th that, that will really heavily influence the rest of the organisation. So try and model these behaviours the best you can. That's all from me. Um, so hopefully that's provided some food for thought and you'll no doubt notice a few similarities between um, the two, two business examples that we've spoken uh, to you about today. So I'll now hand back to Deborah to uh, take questions. Thank you very much. So we'll uh, do a little bit of questions. Um, a few have appeared in the chat. Um, so the, the first one that appeared very early on in Heather's was, are there a set of generic milestones that can be defined for bringing a new product to market? Or are these always different dependent on the project? No, there are, there are, there are definitely milestones that you follow and they are kind of the things about, you know, mini Bible, you know, shortlist, animatic you know there's definite processes the process remains the same it's just the techniques and the content is different each time so yeah there are processes that we follow we have to have some way of managing creativity and by putting a process over the top is the way we do that yeah i agree with that yeah okay um next question is around people and managing people's emotions and ideas um, given that they're often very personal and uh, how do you manage that when when people face rejection for their ideas? Do you want to go first on this one Ralph? <laughs> I'm happy to do that. Because, uh... um, I, I, I think from my perspective it is really important that people feel heard um, and that, that hopefully you've heard the, man, the mantra no idea is a bad idea and that that's back to building that into your company culture. It's but it's also about lots of ideas and you know only, only a few succeed so the faster you know you build that expectation within the business that that is what innovation is all, all about then hopefully people will become less take those things less personally and just understand that that's that's the way innovation works yeah from my point of view this is absolutely core to the idea of having a creative idea because it is intensely personal. Even doing something like sharing a presentation is intensely personal to the person that's doing it because it's your own idea, it's your own thought, and you're laying yourself bare and open for criticism. Um, so I have a huge amount of respect and time for all creators. And I think that idea of taking every question seriously and taking the time to honestly feedback and respond talking about what was good about the idea and really why it didn't work and suggesting a different approach for next time. So, you know, being really mindful of that person's feelings and emotions is tricky. So yeah, careful handling. Mm -hmm. Very important indeed. Um, I'm supposed to be going through questions, but I'm going to put comments in as well here. This has been brilliant. Thank you. So that's just one comment coming into the, the chat that I thought I'd share with you while we're on, on route mm -hmm. through. Um, you, you talked a little bit about common elements at the very end, Ralph, that there were a few common elements. Anything you would pull out for people um, in terms of having listened to both present, well, having listened to Heather's and presented your own, what are your common elements? I, I think the one of the standouts is the, the fail fast, fail often and, and fail early. I think that is that is absolutely critical. And I, I do see that a lot actually in, in clients where, um, it, it's there is a tendency to oh no I just I just want to you know do a bit more before I get it out there so don't just bring some people as close to you as possible and then share that bouncing around bouncing ideas and never cliche but it, it's really important to do that as early as possible and keep iterating. And for you Heather the same question common elements? Yeah I think that exactly as Ralph says but also the importance of creating a culture and you know it's really important to have a encouraging people to give ideas and make sure they're all fed back on um and sharing sharing the knowledge of what's going on in the company 
so people don't feel isolated. So I think that idea of, of culture yeah. is also equally important. And that brings us to another question that's come in. How do you promote a positive, it's okay to fail culture? Do it yourselves, model it. You know, I, I think, you know, there's nothing better than seeing the, the, the leaders of the business doing the same and accepting it and moving on. Um, I, I think, yeah, that's really powerful seeing, seeing that happen at that level. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And it's just that idea of, um, you know, if just reassuring people it's OK to fail, it's OK to fail, we'll get it better, it will become, become better. So just constant reassurance and, and no consequences. You know, in fact, yeah. there's it's the opposite. There's praise for actually coming up with something, even if it doesn't go anywhere. You know, so I'd uh, you know encourage people to come up with things, whether they work or not. It's the coming up with things that should be praised. In fact, for me, that was one of my takeaways. Um, I, I quite like the call for ideas, Heather, at the beginning of yours. That concept of just gathering as many ideas as possible, but being very succinct about. Literally, I mean, I think you said 30, 40 ideas on two sides yeah. of A4. I mean, yeah. It's literally a line each, but I really yeah. like that concept of just throwing all the ideas down yeah. and then working through them to assess them and, and, and go there. And I think, Ralph, you were saying something similar in terms of your vision and aspiration. And, and I, I agree, we talk a lot about minimum viable product, but I quite like that idea that you've got that, but you also have to have this vision. And I think those, yeah. two, I, those two things together, lots of yeah. ideas, but a vision, for me, are my takeaways. Um, I'm running out of questions, so if there's any other questions from, from our attendees, stick them in now, otherwise we'll bring the, the Q&A to a, a close very shortly. But I do have one other, which is how do you take your creative approach um, into a client engagement? So a quick question for both of you there. So um, generally, um, it's about the way the idea is presented, so making sure you get the story right in any, present in any presentation. Oh, you mean how I get the creative approach to take it into other businesses? So I think it's just about, um, you know, from my broad breadth of experience working at director level in a company, you know, I've obviously lived and breathed in innovation of ideas, generating, nurturing. And I think it's that approach and strategy that, and that it's OK to get it wrong. And there's no idea is a bad idea. So when I'm talking to people about their strategy, I will say, let's just write stuff down. Let's just record stuff. And then the more you do that, the more um, the core of the idea or the core of the problem will come to come to a fore. Yeah, I, I building on that, I, I would say, yeah, making sure that, that you're going right to the top with it um, and and cascading that through the business. So hopefully, you know, consulting directly with the leaders of the business to ensure that they get it and how important that is to cascade down, yeah, building that innovation culture with them. Um, and then, yeah, I, the, my, my way of working is very much a share a virtual whiteboard and scribble. And that it just it's quite disarming, actually, really um, just helping people just jot down their thoughts and ideas in, in collaborative sessions. Actually, that that's my style of working. Uh, actually, people take to that quite, quite quickly and easily. And then, thankfully, you know, the tools available are really um enable us to do that without uh, uh, needing to be there. So that's... So I've got, so I've got one more sort of thing to say on that. And the, that, the other thing is that, you know, you know, very much it's acting as a critical friend of a partner. Mm. You know, we don't know your business as well as you know your business. So it's really about having somebody who will walk alongside you and discuss it with you. Very often, if you're a leader of a company, it's very hard to find anyone to talk to about, about the business in a, in a, in a bigger capacity. You always spend your time in the business rather than on the business. So um, the spirit of a, cr a critical friend rather than a, I'm going to tell you how to run your business now because I'm, I'm absolutely not. Mm, yeah, no, and, and just and I think that really helps build confidence and being confident about what you're doing is, is yeah, the most empowering gift we can really leave is because, um, yeah, then if you're confident, then you can be much bolder with your idea. Right, people were asking about funding. So, bit of good news if you're in the creative industries. Um, a creative industries fund has just been launched uh, to help fast start businesses. It's a fast start business growth pilot um, for UK registered micro and small businesses in the creative sector. 
um, they can apply for a package of support to grow their business from Innovate UK. And that package of support includes ongoing support from Innovate UK Edge and funding of up to £25,000 for innovation projects. Um, do get in touch with us if you are interested in that. Um, but we come to the close of today's we webinar now, and I would like to thank both Heather, Heather and Ralph for their insight today. Um, but as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, in the welcome as participants today in Innovate 2021, you do have the opportunity to access a range of comprehensive business support tailored to your business needs. And if you would like to discuss your business needs further, then please do contact the Innovate UK Edge team and the details are now up on screen for you. Um, finally, from me, thank you for attending today and being part of this series of events. Uh, we will now take a break during the summer, but we will look forward to seeing you later in the year for more Innovate 2021. Thank you.